Here we go again. <laughs> Welcome back to According Bad. My name is Pete Contino. I am your host. Uh, this is continuing on my father's story, Dick Contino. I know I uh, mentioned this in the first episode uh, that I bought him a little handheld tape recorder and he would go for these four mile walks. And um, I asked him if he would just talk into it. And then he just, he did, you know, about six hours of, of story, all in chronological order made it very easy for me. This is continuing on out of the uh, talent show and, you know, some relationships, also anxieties and all this stuff. But the main thing is um, this, the, the army beef coming up. And I'll tell you, this has been around since I was a kid. I'd always hear about it. Um, very interesting story. I know a lot of, a lot of controversy around a lot of people, you know, believing what they want to believe, but to hear him talk about it and, and, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting stuff. It's good stuff, man. I remember growing up with him and hear him tell his stories, and it was very interesting. Anyway, I will not talk long. Let's get right into it. This is my father, Dick Contino. Thank you again for tuning in, and I will see you on the other side of this. Well, he came back, and height was there. He was very, of course, he was very upset to even see me there, you know. And uh, so by the time we got through, you know, as we were getting into it, uh, Hyde saw that it was pretty overwhelming. And obviously we had a rapport with Riccardi. And uh, so at one point he just interrupted and said, look, he says, I'll, I'm going to take this to court, he says, and... Uh, I'm worth a lot of money, and uh, I'm standing on the contract, and I'll, I'll win the case. I'm not going to worry about it. So Riccardi immediately said, you know, like, uh, I'll tear up your, uh, your union card. Then where the hell would you be? Well, like I say, back then they were super strong. Well, the height had to adhere. He said, now, here's the deal. Riccardi says, uh, Contino will take out a show for you for a year. And uh, something, there was something about six months after that. Or whatever, you know, it was, it was like, you know, we're, we're cutting it down to about a year. And uh, so that was the deal. I took out a show for him. And uh, we did really well. You know, he would, he, he decided to make all the money he could make. He wasn't going to fight City Hall that way, so he promoted it. Played all over the country. I mean, screaming teenagers and 500 fan clubs. You know, all the stuff that goes with it. Many members. It was like, it was really something. It was, uh, uh, we're talking now, what was this? Uh, 49, 1949. 19 years old. And, uh, no adverse publicity of any nature. Rudolph Valentino of the Accordion. All that I had established with the Accordion. I'd walk into restaurants. Uh, people would start applauding. Anywhere in the country. You know, just try to cross streets or intersections all the way to Boston. At the, I think it was the RKO working there. With Teenagers backstage, like like rock concerts today, and, uh, you know. I remember one time coming out of the stage door, trying to cross the street, and the the kids just swarmed. They had to call police because it's it, it blocked up traffic for blocks. 
There's that kind of a thing everywhere. You, uh, you get the feeling like it's, it's never going to end. How could it? It's a, it's, it's a romance, you know? But most of the time, it's somewhat romance, but a lot of infatuation. Kind of like, uh, I knew that. You know, I, I had this uh, insight. Well, I could see, you know, I could, I, no matter how hot I was, with the hundreds of kids, like, opening up a stage door and they're going nuts, or they just sit in a the theater all day long. They're doing, like, five, six shows a day then. You know, they show the feature film. And you put on the show, and if I could see, or I'd hear about, you know, other people who were starting out at that time, or groups, no matter who it might be, were a lot of screaming age, teenagers, too. I think probably what I had going for me that I, I couldn't really uh, grasp at the time was the uniqueness of the identity uh, with the accordion. I mean, uh, it was more than just, you know, kids being infatuated with one, one uh, star and another star. Uh, with a lot of people, I guess, what was happening was this uniqueness with the um, with the accordion, you know. So I guess with a lot of people, it remained a love affair instead of just infatuation. Well, that went on for a year, then I I uh, decided to go out and take my own show, you know. But, uh, you know, they took right. Well, they had this, a dear lad, the lad sisters, you know. And, uh, <laughs> she, was, she was not a pretty girl. But for some reason, she was, se she, looked, she looked sexy, you know what I mean? There was a sexier thing. Uh, that, as far as I was concerned, than even this Debbie Davenport, you know what I mean? <laughs> she was something else, man. <laughs> something, you know, uh, the, just the way she was built. You know, kind of a little cuteness in her smile and stuff. Anyway, uh, jumped all over that. One of the sisters, the uh, uh, Adair, Adair lad. I mean, <laughs> we were both like nymphomaniacs, I never, <laughs> quite an experience, I mean, well, that was just kind of a, oh yeah, the reason I brought that up is because it got so intensified, <laughs> it got so intensified, you know, that I, I was losing weight, and I was down to about 155 pounds, and my dick weighed 140, you know, <laughs> So <laughs> Nanny and Grandpa got wind of it. You know, they go, Jesus. And Mom and Dad got wind of it. You know, Jesus Christ. You know, we try to make this light. And uh, so they decided we better get back there and see what's going on. You know, because I didn't care about the shows. And Al Simonelli, a guy named Al Simonelli, was my uh, road manager. I guess he noted that I'd be late for shows. You know. <laughs> it seemed unusual to walk out on stage, you know, and start with the accordion with my dick in my hand, you know. It didn't look quite natural, you know. Called it. <laughs> I always seem to walk around with my dick in my hand. So anyway, I guess, you know, the, so my, now my mom and dad show up with, with, my, with, Uncle, with my Uncle Tony, my mother's youngest brother. And uh, because, you know, he always had an influence in my life. Tony, you better talk to him, you know. <laughs> well, they got back there. I couldn't seem to let this lad, sister, a dear lad go that way, you know. So they said, well, we better disband this show. 
forget about it. I got a hold of Joe Glazer out of New York, Associated Booking Corporation, the guy who discovered Louis Armstrong. A lot of other great acts, but he they gave up the Horace Hyde account because he believed in me, you know. Joe Glazer, he was quite a thing in my life too because old the Jewish guy he used to work for the work with the mob out of New York. He decided to go to Jet, you know, and booking agency. I was like his adopted son that way. Well, he says, we have this band to show and send him out as a single on his own. It took me about just two weeks to get over that at the air, lad. I got, I left the show, went out to, they took me to Palm Springs, uh, Santa Monica, and rented a room there a couple weeks out on the beach. You know, for some reason, it just didn't, just two weeks. Uh, you don't think about it. But uh, I started doing a single, breaking records everywhere. Everywhere. San Francisco at the RKO. Cleveland, Ohio. Chicago. Oriental. Uh, Chicago Theater. Kids going crazy. Shows from about 10 in the after, 10 in the morning until about 8 o'clock at night. It seemed like uh, it was going to be endless love, you know? Never end. Even, uh, even though I thought, you know, in time, this, you know, Something's got to start dwindling, but you don't think of it that, that way at the time. You think, no, man, this is a great love affair, no matter what happens. And that, uh, like I see, that went on about as intensified as you can imagine, as glorious. Talking movie contracts, signing movie contracts, Paramount Pictures, Jerry Wall, Norman Krasner, two pictures a year, seven year deal. Uh, RC Victor, contract, first album, Mr. Accordion. The only time in my life. Uh, it lasted a very short period where my folks had to say he's got to have time off working too much 1949 part of 1950 that's about it the Korean War came along I can say though these phobias, okay. all of my life, uh, yeah, my youth, and like I said earlier, you know, if I couldn't seem to work around them, I could take on illness physically rather than face up to it, something. I thought, if you tried to explain to somebody, I didn't know about psychiatrists, psychologists, I thought if you tried to explain to somebody how you really felt, what was your problem? They think, what, you know, that, that Italian upbringing. And we're talking, we're talking in the 40s. We're talking in the 30s, if you will. I was born in 1930. You say, what do you, you know, mom, you know, dad, or you know, friend, I feel this way. I feel the fear of this and the fear of that. And I feel like I can't do anything about it. What are you, crazy? <laughs> you know, what do you mean you can't? Come on. You didn't even know anything like that was treatable. Never heard of such a thing. In spite of my success and everything, I I had this suppressed, this hidden torment. 
go to check into a hotel room. And I always look for a, a way, you know, how to deal with it. I, I, I'd always say, can I have a, a room close to the, no higher than the fourth floor and close to the stairway. It wasn't as afraid, but I, and they'd say, well, why? I'd say, because I'm afraid of fires. <laughs> that was a lie. Well, I, I'm just as afraid as anybody of a fire, but that wasn't why. The reason was, simply put, I had to be where I can get downstairs right now if I had to. Why? I don't know. A fear, the anxiety of being trapped and uh, even having to wait for an elevator. That may take, what, seconds, a minute? But to know I could leave whenever I wanted to, hit the stairway and down. Knowing that, I could wait for the elevator. Figure that one out. This phobia. Mainly, I thought at the time that was it. Anxieties, you know. Hey, man, I was the most successful fucking youth in the world. I'm making money. I'm su su adoring fans. And but tormented, you know. Couldn't really enjoy it. 1949 at the Albee Theater, Cincinnati. I was so hot then, man. They were lined around the block four deep. The whole world must have thought, this fucking guy must really be bathing in this glory. Now, on one particular day, I'm upstairs in that dressing room, crying like a baby. As I hit upon one of these goddamn phobias, I couldn't seem to get around. What was it? A fear of going to sleep. How about that shit? Well, you gotta sleep, man. In order to live, you gotta get some sleep. I say, hey, I found myself lying there. Yeah, this is it. To go into detail just for a minute. Lying there, going, when do, when do I, when, when do you pass from like uh, the, the conscious to the subconscious or unconscious? When do you, what's sleep all about? You gotta let go. No, I'm afraid to let go. When do I let go? What happens? When, you know. Uh, Wait, like you're waiting. You got your eyes closed, but you're waiting to see. Just when do you pass from conscious to unconscious and the fear of it? The fear of it. I think I was somewhat still Catholic that way. My folks and my manager, Al Simonelli, says. I'm going to go see a Catholic priest. That didn't seem to help. Not at all. It would come and go with intensity. Naturally, I slept eventually, if nothing else, through exhaustion. And back then, I took sleeping pills. You know, strong ones. So eventually, I just drifted off to sleep. Be grateful that I want to get very intensified that I could... Uh, get the sleep I needed, rest so I could function the following day. Goddamn phobias, man. Anxieties and shit. I'm glad I've come to, you know, into a teaching where I can see how it operates and what it's about more. And that's why, you know, I, I couldn't just stick with a church that said you go to confession and you ask God to heal you. Maybe that works with a lot of people, but I needed something deeper. My thirst was, my hunger was deeper. We tried going to a psychiatrist and shit. There was a, a hypnotist very popular back then, Dr. Arthur Ellen. Tried that. However, you know, I'd get through it, and then the intensity would lessen, and I'd sleep better. Would seem to leave, I'd be fine. Seen the sleeping pills, the partying, or whether my mind being distracted here and there. Okay, I dealt with that phobia 
that way. So had the others. Now, living in all this tor torment, here comes the Korean War. I knew I couldn't do it. Well, I had as much fear as the next guy about being shot at and all that shit. Or not really, uh, you know, enjoying the idea of shooting at somebody else. I didn't enjoy that, the thought of that, but it was a deep thing. It was this, I knew it couldn't be without my family. I, I could be in a crowd of people. And still feel alone, and not just alone. Like, I hate that cliche when people say, yeah, I know what you mean. You don't know what the fuck I mean. You don't know. You're not in my head. You don't, you don't know the degree, the intensity, the fear. So I got my first notice. There was a Dr. Polito in Glendale, a friend of the family. I went to him and I heard if you have a punctured eardrum, they won't let you in, you know. I asked him to puncture one of my ears. How about that? How about that? He said, I can't do it, you know. And then I thought, what? I tried to claim dependence. You know, the family was depending on me. Anything to get 4F. I couldn't go in. Who's going to understand me? Uh, what do you mean you can't go in? I can't. What do you mean? I don't know. I can't do it. So I had to rely on something they could relate to. Like I went for my first physical, they said, you have a pilonidal cyst on the end of your spine. You need to have that operated on before we can induct you. So I used that, see? I used that. Uh, I'm afraid of knives, I told them. I'm afraid of being operated on. That, yeah, I'm just as, no, I wasn't afraid of that. I was afraid of being knocked out. My fear of, you know, being knocked out was much greater than any, who gives a shit once you, you consent to that, you to be operated on, you know. But you, that was the fear. But they don't even understand a fear of being operated on knives. Came back six, did you, six months later. Did you have it operated on? Uh, no, I, I'm afraid of knives. Well, we'll take you anyway. Well, as you know, it's going, you know, what's going on in the future as far as when we'll induct you, whatever. Man, I was crapping out. What do I do? I did the shows, cover up my anxieties, fears. Try to enjoy the, the glory of it all. But in the back, what about this anxiety? What about this phobia? What about the army thing? Woo, that really loomed. in Minneapolis, Minnesota at the Nicolette Hotel. My Uncle Tony called up and says, you got your final draft notice. They want you to report for induction in two weeks. All right, there you go. Final draft notice. It gets good now. Well, it's all good. But okay. <laughs> Well, again, I thank you for sticking around and listening. And if you have any questions or just send me something, you know, uh, I got my email on my website, but it's cordianbrat at gmail.com. That's where you can email me. All right. Well, again, hope to see you next week or talk to you next week. Thanks again. Bye.